chapter 6. And uh, just to remind you, we have been talking first of all about particles. And we have, uh, we have the particle of the standard model plus super partners. And then plus a new Higgs. So in total, two Higgs in total. So that's, that's a new, new object introduced there. Two interactions. For interactions, I went through each of the, of the arbitra arbitrary uh, functions of the, that defines a, a, a supersymmetric Lagrangian, the K, W, F, and Psi, since they are all uh, given by, by the renormalizable theory. And the, the main conclusions we extracted were out of W, the non-trivial ones, uh, W because you, you extract the typical couplings, which were Yukawa couplings of uh, quarks to Higgses and leptons to Higgses, but also we extracted some variant and lepton number violating operators, and that was dangerous, so that led us to introduce uh, our parity. And our parity uh, was introduced to prevent uh, to forbid this uh, dangerous couplings of uh, that break baryon and lepton number. <clears throat> I also told you that uh, f was a constant, and that was giving us the um, the gauge couplings. The real part of f was giving us the gauge couplings, and they unify in a supersymmetric theory, which is good. And uh, k was the trivial um, quadratic phi dagger phi coupled to gay superfield, so, so and psi was zero because of uh, gay uh, symmetries. So that's what we started, and then the, I, we stopped yesterday, and, uh, and our parity was uh, used to prevent those, uh, those dangerous couplings, but it also had some interesting implications, like uh, implying that there is a lower supersymmetric uh, particle, and then um, then there was a good candidate for dark matter, that is the neutralinos, and, uh, and also the signatures and colliders of uh, missing energy. So everything was uh, a consequence of uh, our parity. Okay, so let me just finish this chapter with the... Uh, three is Susie breaking. Okay, so... <clears throat> We have to recall that in the standard model, we have two sectors. You have uh, one sector I can call, put here in a box. You have the <coughs> observable sector. where you have all the standard model particles, quarks, leptons, and so on. And then we have another sector here, which is the symmetry breaking sector. Where we expect here to have just the Higgs. This is still a question mark, I have to remind you, because all this has been seen, all this is standard model particles, and the Higgs is just the mechanism that breaks the symmetry. We expect that it's just a, sing, single, um, a scalar field that breaks the symmetry, but it may be something else. But there has to be a mechanism that breaks the symmetry. And uh, so we have the two different sectors, and they are coupled. by Yukawa couplings, essentially. For instance, the Yukawa, remember you have Higgs, fermion, fermion, and then uh, the fermions are any of these uh, quarks and leptons and coupled to the Higgs, and then, so then this tells the Higgs, tells the, the 
the fermions that the symmetry has been broken, and then once they know that the symmetry is broken, then they get a mass. Okay, that's that's the idea. So, this, uh, <coughs> so the Higgs break the symmetry, and immediately the fermions get a mass. In supersymmetry, the situation is a bit different, but it's very similar to to this picture. So, in supersymmetry. In general, we will need three sectors. We will have a box with an observable sector, as we already have in the standard model. And then we will have a box with a Susie breaking sector. So that means that we have to introduce new particles, new superfields that eventually will break supersymmetry. And at the end, they have to couple to each other. So in general, they could couple straight, but that will, that will be a very particular case, and usually it doesn't work very well. So in usually, what you have is a third sector which is the messenger. <laughs> messenger sector. And this will be the generic case. OK, so, so what this happens is that we have been discussing only the observable sector. We only introduced the standard model particles and so on. But at some point, we ha something has to break supersymmetry. And this something has to break supersymmetry, it has to be um, a new sector of particles, so you have to introduce new superfields. And then this will tell the messengers, you know, supersymmetry has been broken. And then these guys say, well, supersymmetry is broken, now multiple is split. So they all split. Okay, that's, 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 the, that's, the, that's the message they transmit. So at the end, they tell, they tell this sector that uh, supersymmetry has been broken. And then uh, the masses of fermions and bosons will be different. Okay, so most of the uncertainty about supersymmetric models comes not that much from the supersymmetry breaking sector, but from the messenger sector, how we, how we know the supersymmetry was broken. But so let me discuss each of the two new sectors. So the supersymmetry breaking sector. We discussed uh, previously that, uh, that you can break supersymmetry, and you can break it at tree level. Uh, but uh, that is usually very bad, in the sense that uh, you will get very light um, super partners that will be contradicting the experiment. So just remember that you have the splitting above and below of, of, of the, of the um, of the fermions in the in the arithmetic model, for instance, so we need a breaking. If and, and uh, since it is not broken at tree level, we don't want it to break it at tree level. We cannot break it at any order in perturbation theory, because of the normalization theorems. And then that means that uh, we have to break supersymmetry non-perturbatively. Okay. Any questions? No. Okay. Okay. So. from non-perturbative effects. This is very important. The, the, the conclusion is a simple argument, but it's very important. So this is the strength of the normalization theorems tell you that you have to break it in a non-perturbative way. So um, what does this mean? So I'll give you an example. And the example is uh, you take the, in the SUSI breaking sector, let's have a, a model with, a, say, a group, say G, it can be SUN or can be any, any, anything, SUN, say with some matter.
such that it is asymptotically free. Such that it's asymptotically free. Asymptotically free, by now you, you know it, so you have uh, the energy against the coupling. <coughs> And the coupling starts very small at the large energies and essentially grows and grows very high. And then you get a typical scale, which it becomes very strong, which is scale lambda. And that is the, the scale of the model, like a lambda QCD. Like QCD has an intrinsic scale that is uh, essentially when, when the coupling becomes strong, that's lambda QCD that defines the scale of, of uh, strong interactions. The same thing happens in uh, any asymptotically free model. You will define this, uh, this uh, intrinsic scale, lambda. And uh, it so happens that in models of this type, you may get. Uh, the model itself. It's, uh, for instance, QCD is asymptotically free. We, why, why? Because you have SU3, but with the corresponding spectrum of, uh, of, uh, of the number of, of, uh, of uh, families that you have, then you compute the beta function and you get it to run this way. If you have different spectrum, you will run it a different way. So it depends on the, on the, on the gauge group and the, and the spectrum of particles to tell you when the theory is asymptotically free or not. Okay. So you compute the beta function, it depends on the number of colors, number of flavors, and so on. So to get the negative beta function, it has to combine the different uh, uh, values of, 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 the, of your, of your uh, theory. Did you know? I don't know what you mean by free. Free. I will mean by free. Um, when did I use the word free? I forgot. <laughs> when did I use it? Oh, asymptotically free. Oh. <laughs> yes. So you haven't seen that in field theory, asymptotically free. You have seen it. I probably have, but I'm not quite sure. Well, asymptotically, you know, asymptote, this is an asymptote. And free means that the gauge coupling is becoming very, very small. It's becoming to zero. So free means that there is no coupling. Yes. yes. Actually, we call asymptotically expensive if it goes in this way. <laughs> but that's a... Anyway. <laughs> so... <clears throat> So okay, so <clears throat> good. So so this is a, a. You haven't seen this. This is important. So please uh, uh, go back to your field theory <laughs> and, and and check um, uh, where you have seen these things. Because this is the running of the gauge couplings with the normalization group. So this is normalization group equations go from from weak coupling to strong coupling. And in many, in some models, for for instance, you can have. If, for instance, you can have, I say, pure, pure young meals. You can have the gaginos, which are the super partners of the corresponding gauge bosons here. They can get a wave. So the, a, a pair of gaginos, since they are fermions, you have to make a, a scalar out of them. And then they can condense. They can get a vacuum expectation value different from zero. This is similar, for instance, like uh, Cooper pairs in, 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 uh, in superconductors. And, and this, this value, different from zero, is induced by the, by the theory becoming strongly coupled. So if it's strongly coupled, then the fermions can condense, can, can they get close to each other. So that, that's, that's why it, it, this happens in this kind of theories and doesn't happen when the theory is, is, is weakly coupled. So this is a, a strongly coupled effect. So then you expect, by dimensional arguments, this to be proportional to lambda cube, where lambda is that scale. And uh, <clears throat> at the end, depending on your model, this effect, especially in, in your couple to, in supergravity theories, you can see that at the end, uh, supersymmetry can be broken. So you will get a supersymmetry breaking scale of order this lambda. And lambda, since it is a, a normalization group running, this will be equals to the high energy scale, say, for instance, n-plank, if you want, you want to start, times e to the minus a constant divided by g square, and g at, at, the, at the value of the, of the large energies. So, <clears throat> so, for instance, you start here with n-plank. 
And so this is very interesting because this lambda scale is, in, is the scale, the natural scale of the theory that is hierarchically smaller than the Planck scale because there's, there is this big suppression which is exponential. So this can be much smaller than in Planck. Okay. Yes, question? <laughs> what I mean by vacuum expectation value of? What is that lambda lambda? Uh, lambda lambda, you, you, you have no problems in having a vacuum expectation value for a scalar, for instance. If Higgs has a vacuum expectation value. That means that the value of the Higgs at the minimum of a potential is, is, is that. So the same thing will be for this. This lambda lambda effectively is a scalar because uh, it's, it's, you have two fermions, so they give you a scalar. So at the end, you may consider the corresponding, say, potential for this uh, object and then see if it condenses or not, if it is zero or different from zero. If it is different from zero, then. What is the physical meaning? Yes. Well, it's, it's just uh, you have two fermions condensing, they get a vacuum expectation value. The, the uh, but what, what the irritates is somehow is that um, we say when the coupling becomes strong, um, well, exactly. Exactly. The coupling becomes strong is that when you because the, the coupling is strong, then you can have the two fermions. One can attract each other, so you can have the two, two fermions together. Imagine, roughly speaking, imagine a Cooper pair in uh, superconductivity. So you have two fermions together, and they act as a boson that breaks U1 in the in, the, in the superconductivity. It's precisely the, the the Cooper pair acts like a Higgs field. So that's the thing that breaks the U1 of electromagnetism in 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 the, in the superconductor. So it, so it acts like an uh, effective scalar field that gets a vacuum expectation value and then break, breaks the symmetry. So in this case, this, this object, this is an example. Eh? So just to give you a rough idea of, of what, what uh, happens when you have um, number two body effects in field theory. And, uh, and so this is an example where this can happen. So, and, and this is very much used in supergravity models and, and, and uh, string models where you have the condensation of a, of a genus being different from zero. So that they, they, they have a wave. And then that induces an, a, a wave of an, a, an F term that breaks supersymmetry. Okay, so I, I cannot give you the, all the details of a model because. Um, but it's in proportional to um, lambda cubed. But, but it's a dimensional argument. Remember, the Fermi has dimension three halves. Three halves and three halves is three. So they have lambda cubed. Yeah. So that's, that's just dimensional arguments because that's, that's the only scale in the. In the that, that's the scale that is in, inducing the, the, the condensation. So that you expect it to be proportional to lambda, and by dimensional arguments, it's lambda cube. Yes. Well, thank you. It's good to ask the questions because that uh, that uh, that tells us uh, that helps understanding better. So, any more questions? Yes. You can ask it in Italian if you can. <laughs> no. I was. <laughs> okay. Okay, very good. So, so this is the, the, an example, and just to tell you that uh, this is uh, something that uh, is, is the preferred way of breaking supersymmetry by non perturbative effects, not necessarily a genome condensation, just usually a non, um, a, a non perturbative effect in a non trivial sector of, 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 a, of a supersymmetric theory, and that will be what we'll define as the SUSY se breaking sector. Okay. There are many ways of breaking supersymmetry in this way, and there's a large uh, industry of people building models that break or do not break supersymmetry uh, with or with, uh, in global supersymmetry or supergravity. So this defines the supersymmetry breaking sector that we add to what we already discussed, the observable sector. What about the messenger sector? <coughs> so the messenger sector This is uh, the most model dependent part of your of of of, of, uh, of supersymmetric models. That's the thing that that at the end has more influence in uh, in the observable physics. So there are <coughs> several ways of um, transmitting the, the the information the supersymmetry was broken, and they are well the, one of probably the most popular is uh, gravity mediation. Gravity mediation means that uh, if you have broken supersymmetry here, uh, someone here 
sooner or later we'll know it. And why? Because gravity couples to everybody. So gravity has, is completely democratic, has no prejudices, it couples equally to everybody in the same way. So you have broken supersymmetry here, uh, so you may, this Particles here may not couple to them by gauge interactions or by direct couplings, but uh, through gravity or, or through gravitational interactions, they will eventually know. So you cannot hide that supersymmetry is broken. So usually this sector is called a hidden sector. And it's, it's hidden as much as you can hide. It's hidden, but nothing is hidden to gravity. So gravity is everywhere, couples to everybody, and it's always present. Okay. Okay. Um, well, I don't, I don't say more. <laughs> um, OK, so, so gravity mediation is, is, is uh, something you cannot avoid. And uh, it, it has several interesting properties. And that has been probably the, 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 the mechanism that has been most, most studied. Uh, since it is gravity mediated, you know then that the mass splitting <laughs> in the observable sector will be delta n. And delta n, since they know only through gravity, it has to come suppressed by, by power of the Planck, Planck scale, but n Planck. And uh, then for dimensional reasons, then you have to have here and so breaking square. So if you, break, if you don't break supersymmetry, this will be zero. They will not be splitted. If you break supersymmetry, this will be different from zero. But it's not the splitting of the multiples is not of the same order at the scale of supersymmetry breaking. But it is the supersymmetry breaking scale square divided by n Planck. And this, this n Planck here is telling you that it's gravity, which is a very weak interaction, that is telling you that supersymmetry was broken. So you can make a simple calculation here that uh, when we want delta n, w which values? 10, 10 and 1TEV, very, very good. So we want delta n of a TEV. I know that n Planck has a value that is like a 10 to the, say, 18 GeV, or 10 to the 19 GeV, depending on your conventions. And so that means that M sub C breaking has to be essentially the, the geometrical mean of uh, delta M, which is uh, the electroweak scale, and the Planck scale. And this is of order of 10 to the 11 GeV, you can plug this in your computer and, and, and get the result. Uh, so this is 10 to the 11 GeV. So this is an intermediate scale, which is interesting. So there is an intermediate scale between the Planck scale and the electroweak where you can break supersymmetry and, and yet get the splitting of the multiples to be of the order of 1 TeV. Okay. <clears throat> so, also, in this case, the gravitino, the gravitino gets a mass because it was the partner of the, of the graviton. And the gravitino gravitino. So once you break supersymmetry, the gravitino gets a mass. And, and, and so that mass will be of the same order. So M sub C breaking scale divided by M Planck. So then it's a for our TV. Okay. By the way, as an aside, the Gravitino getting a mass as a signature of supersymmetry breaking is something called the super Higgs effect. So the super Higgs effect was, is that with, if you don't break supersymmetry, the gravitino is massless because it's the partner of the graviton. But <clears throat> if 
you break supersymmetry, then it, is, it has a similar effect to what happens when you break a gauge symmetry, that the, gauge, the corresponding gauge boson gets a mass. Here, the gauge field of supersymmetry is the gravitino. So the gravitino has, how, how does the gravitino get a mass? In the similar way that the gauge boson gets a mass in a symmetry breaking. How does the gauge boson get a mass? Is the, the, the gauge boson eat the Goldstone boson, remember, and become massive. So you get the extra degree of freedom from the Goldstone boson and get, becomes massive. Here, the gravitino eats something else. What is it that it eats? It's the Goldstino. There's a Goldstino, which is a spin one half object. It's, it's eaten by the gravitino to get the, the extra degree of freedom and then become massive. So. Just to warn you, this is different from the standard supersymmetric version of the Higgs effect. Because there is a supersymmetric version of the standard Higgs effect in which the whole vector superfield is a whole scalar, a whole, whole chiral superfield to become massive. So that is a supersymmetric version of the standard Higgs effect. Okay? So you have a Higgs effect and you supersymmetrize it. This is different. This is the, the super Higgs effect. <laughs> effect. This is the Higgs effect for supersymmetry. When you break supersymmetry, the corresponding gauge field of supersymmetry, which is the gravitino, it's the Goldstino, which is a fermion, to get a mass. Okay, so don't confuse the two concepts, which are named very similar. Excuse me? Yes? Could you tell us once again how you derive the formula for delta m for the mass uh, splitting? Yes. It's, it's, this is just heuristic, but the, the, the this is how it works. You say that delta m. It, it, they know that supersymmetry was broken only after you broke, uh, after only through gravitational interactions. So the gravitational interactions are suppressed by one over m Planck. Okay, so that, that's 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 the because one over m Planck is essentially a Newton's constant. Eh? So essentially, so you get uh, uh, one over m Planck in the, in the denominator, and uh, by dimensional analysis, you have to have in the numerator the something that broke supersymmetry. So it's m sub c. It has to be squared to get the right uh, units. Okay. okay. So that, that, that's that's. A, so if supersymmetry is not broken, that is zero. So then you, it has to be in the numerator of the supersymmetry breaking scale. Okay. So this is uh, what happened in the. In gravity mediation. Let me just move this up just to. And uh, <clears throat> then there is the second one is gauge mediation. In which <clears throat> In which the total gauge group is equal to the, the gauge group of the standard model. Times a gauge group of the sector that breaks supersymmetry. And, uh, <clears throat> but there are particles of matter fields charged so let me just call, this is the a standard model or observable gauge group, charged under both. So the new particles in the gravity mediation case, the particles that you introduce here, they are all singlets under the standard model. So it's only gravity that tells you the supersymmetry is broken. But that doesn't have to be the case. So it could be that there are particles that are charged under this group that also have some electric charge, or there are doublets of SU2, or something like that. They feel also the gauge interactions of the standard model. So then the mediator of, of, of supersymmetry breaking, the messenger of supersymmetry breaking, are the gauge interactions. Okay. In this case, since the interactions are not 
surprised by, by, by gravitational interaction by M Planck. So the, in this case, the splitting of the multiples is essentially of the same order um, as M SUSI breaking. Okay. And since we want it to be of order TeV, so we want this to be of order 1 TeV. However, notice that on the other hand, the gravitino mass, since it belongs only to the gravity multiplet, will still be equal to M SUSI breaking square over M Planck. And then this, if you make the calculation, is of order 10 to the minus 3 electron volts. So the gravitino is extremely, extremely light. Okay. There's nothing wrong with this, because the gravitino is so weakly coupled. But so the physics of these two mechanisms is, are very, very different. In particular, this will imply that the gravitino is your LSP, is the lightest supersymmetric particle in this case. What is special about the particle? Uh, well, it's, it's the partner of the graviton. The graviton is unique, so it's n equals to 1. The gravitino is also unique. And okay, is it the only particle that acquires mass under the superheaps effects? No, no. The no, no. Uh, no. The, well, no. The gravitino is special because it is like the, like the remember when we discussed about, about um, um, uh, when we introduced supergravity, I told you that the gravitino was like a, like a corresponding gauge particle of the supersymmetry uh, supersymmetry algebra. Like a, the graviton is, is the graviton is. No, that, that, everything is there. You have all the all the observable sector, and you have the graviton and the gravitino. The gravitino. The thing is, the gravitino is model independent, as the graviton is. So you can have many particles in, in the gauge uh, sectors. But the gravitino is always there. As long as you have gravity, you have the gravitino uh, as, 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 as part of the multiplet. So that, that's why we, we, we can always say something concrete about it, because it's very model independent. Yes, that's a good point. OK. And the last. The last uh, mechanism that is called, it's called anomaly mediation. This will not say that much because uh, it's less transparent to, 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 um, to explain without details. Essentially, it's, uh, we have to say that the auxiliary fields of, the, of supergravity multiple get a bit of a And uh, these are also model independent, and they transform, they carry, uh, this particular field carry, um, tra it transforms non trivially under scale transformations. And that's why, it, and you know, scale transformations, the, the, for instance, the uh, electromagnetism is, is invariant under scale transformations. And then that's a classical symmetry, and then the, this classical symmetry becomes broken by quantum effects, and that's why it's called. Um, the conformal anomaly, because it's broken, the quantum effects break conformal invariance. And uh, so this anomaly means conformal anomaly mediation. And uh, so I, it is always present. It's always present. And but usually suppressed. By loop effects. So it's only a, a one loop. And so. Um, effect. So usually, it's it very often it's suppressed compared to the, to the other mechanisms. But the important thing is always present that you have to to deal with it, either you like it or not. So it's something that that uh, uh, is worth studying. I know that some of you may be doing this as an essay topic for, for the, with the Ben Alanach. So, but unfortunately, I have no time to say more about uh, about this. The, well, yes, this is a kind of new. Relatively new compared to the other two, this is 1999 physics. So it's, it's not that you were still you were already grown up already for when this happened. So. <coughs> 
Okay, so these messenger sectors, what they do to us is uh, uh, that is where more, most of the of the model dependent part you know, of the of the supersymmetric models is li lies on, on on this. So that that is. Um, that's why there, there is not a unique way of building a model in, in supersymmetry. So there are many, many, many things that are, are not under control because they, they depend on who is the messenger and so on. So uh, at the end of the day, in, in every of, the, of this uh, mechanism, we have they induce an effective Lagrangian for all of them. At the end, we have a total Lagrangian will be plus L supersymmetry breaking for the effective fields for, for the observable six. And uh, the L supersymmetry breaking just call L uh, soft breaking terms. Uh, this takes the form of uh, Gagino masses. So, so you can put. Then uh, it has the scalar masses. Then you have some trilinear terms. Essentially, these are the main. There's an extra term, but which I, I will not mention. Uh, excuse me. Yes. Is that about the lambda with two upstairs indices. Lambda a, lambda a. Just to say, well, they are contracting. But whoever the lambdas carry some indices of the, the uh, gauge indices, so they are contracted. Um, you, hmm? No, no spinner indices. Yes, you have spinner indices and so on. On top of that, you want, you don't want me to write indices. Oh, okay. Yes, I, 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 yes, it's lambda lambda. You have all the, just uh, to be less clear. <laughs> so that means that uh, you have lambda lambda for every, every single gauge group, and then you have a, a corresponding lambda. The same thing for scalars. This, this is not one scalar, but there are many scalars. All the, this will be Gagino masses for all the Gaginos. Scalar masses. And these are trilinear terms. Okay. And uh, essentially, when, when you study supersymmetric, the, this, uh, so the parameter space of supersymmetric models will be classified by the set of, the set of m lambdas, the set of m zero squares, and the set of a's. And, uh, and, and that, that's that what is at the end that you will confront with uh, whatever you observe in, 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 uh, in, uh, in experiment if there is something uh, that indicates supersymmetry. So these are the basic parameters that you, you determine given your model. You have a, breaking, a, a messenger sector that will determine what is an expression for m lambda, what is the expression for m0, what is the expression for a, for instance. Then you, that, that gives you the value of those uh, um, parameters at, uh, at your scale, where you just build your model. For instance, if it is string scale, uh, string theory at the string scale, and then you run all these parameters by the normalization group equations, like a like the gauge coupling run, and then see what are their effects at low energies. And from that, you can compute the spectrum of all your, all your particles, and then compare with, uh, with, with experimental observations if eventually this occur. Okay, so so uh, this, these terms were classified by Girardello and, um, and Grisaro in the late 70s. And uh, so it's a model independent way. So when two people talk about the, the MSSM, it's essentially people talk about the, the supersymmetric part plus these soft breaking terms. Okay. It's soft breaking terms because they do not affect the good ultraviolet properties of supersymmetric models. So the good ca the cancellations that I mentioned to you, they they they, they are still um, preserve even with these terms that break supersymmetry. So this is good. So this, I only have eight minutes to go, and uh, instead of starting a new chapter, since today's lecture was very much uh, descriptive, 
So let me just finish and made it, make it completely descriptive. So I, I will just uh, uh, say some words about um, about uh, the good or bad things about supersymmetry in general. And so, for instance, we have to reconsider the hierarchy problem. So I would like to emphasize, because this has been essentially the main reason why people have studied supersymmetry and, and tried to make a, 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 in order to make contact with the, with, the, with the experiment. Of course, people study supersymmetry without any phenomenological interest. But for phenomenology, the hierarchy, the hierarchy problem has been the main reason why to study supersymmetry at low energies. So, and, uh, so let me just recall, uh, in, the, in the standard model, in a standard model, we know that, for instance, the gauge particles, so spin one, massless, and we do not get surprised. Why do we, why why is it? Do you know why the photon is massless? Can you tell me why the photon is massless? Uh, or the remaining uh, symmetry. Uh, when we choose a uh, two, uh, two component Higgs field and make an arbitrary choice for the ground state, yes. and there's one linear combination of the generators that uh, maps uh, the ground state to zero. Exactly, very good. Thank you very much. So th what it happens at the end is that after you break the symmetry of the standard model, there's still one symmetry remaining, which is U1 uh, electromagnetism. And because of the U1 electromagnetism, that means that you cannot write any mass term in, in your Lagrangian that is uh, cons um, consistent with this U1 gauge invariance, because the U1 gauge invariance is present there if there is no ma not a mass term for the gauge field. So that means that we understand the massless of those particles because of gauge invariance. So we know, and we don't worry about why the photon is massless, because we know there is a symmetry principle that tells it's massless because there is a symmetry there that protects it to, from getting a mass. The same thing with fermions. So for fermions, you cannot write a mass term for the fermions because of gauge invariance. So there is a symmetry that tells us that you do, you, the fermions don't get a mass before the, the Higgs effect happens. Okay, so again, gauge invariance. Forbids terms of the type m psi psi. Remember that. To have psi psi copies, you need a Higgs here to get a VF. But just a mass term, plain mass term, <coughs> you don't find it in the Lagrangian. So again, gauge invariance explains why fermions are massless. However, for bosons, no symmetry argument, or no symmetry protection. And that's the reason why people talk about the hierarchy problem. And uh, so we say, well, the bosons, just, they just can get a mass. And then they're they cannot, they, they, they not protected at all. And so they can get as heavy as, as the value of, of, of your cutoff in your theory. And, uh, and, uh, and that's, that was the problem with, uh, with the Higgs in particular, because the Higgs is, is a boson. And then there's no reason to, to have the Higgs very light in the standard model. For supersymmetry. We say that since you have bosons and fermions in the same multiplet, that's the simplest way to say, well, supersymmetry solves the hierarchy problem. Since the fermions cannot get a mass because of gauge invariance, now there are partners of bosons, so the bosons cannot get a mass neither. And that's it. So that's the solution of the hierarchy problem. No problem. And the other way to say is that, uh, as I told you the other day, is that this miraculous constellations. To the Higgs mass that I, that I mentioned the other day. And that 
that uh, that's reinforces the fact that supersymmetry actually solves the hierarchy problem. So that's that's very good. However, let's see if it, how good is is is, uh, is supersymmetry for that. So you solve the hierarchy problem, and that's actually the main reason. And th there are also some nice nice things about supersymmetry. You solve the hierarchy problem. You have gauge coupling unifications. You have a good candidate for dark uh, matter. You have these three. And there are other things like, uh, for instance, if you go for many of these models, you study the, the potential for the Higgs. In the standard model, you put the potential for the Higgs by hand just to break the symmetry. In supersymmetry, even if, if, the, if you start with the, with the Lagrange for the potential, which is that, uh, symmetric, by corrections, by uh, relative corrections, the, the, the potential shape, uh, changes the shape to the, to the potential like this, and you, you induce naturally a, a non-zero f to the Higgs in, by relative corrections. That was something very nice. And the way to see that you start with the mass term, which is positive, the mass evolves on, on with relative corrections, and change, at some point it changes sign. The mass squared changes sign, that means that you have a maximum instead of a minimum. And at the end, you develop minimum farther away. So that's nice. So the supersymmetry somehow explains the, the, the Higgs effect in, in many of the models. Uh, that was very nice because that required in the running to be very important. That required a, a mass of the top quark to be extremely heavy. That was proposed in the 80s. And, and at that time, people didn't know that the, quark was, the top quark was heavy. And it was good because in 95, they discovered the top quark with a mass of uh, 175 GeV or so. so and that, 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 that gives another uh, good point about supersymmetric models. However, you have to admit that uh, there's not everything is nice about supersymmetric models. You start adding a lot of things which you do not control. The messenger uh, of supersymmetry breaking is one thing that you do not control. And so there are many model independent things. These soft breaking terms that I wrote for you here, they have all these sort of indices. And they can induce things like uh, flavor changing neutral currents and things like that that have not been observed. So you have to, a lot of constraints from experiments. So there are things which are not very nice on, on, on supersymmetric models, but things which are nice. Uh, so you may, and one, but one thing that I think is very, very bad, and uh, you give me three more minutes, I just finished with my sermon today. Mm -hmm. So um, you, you, you uh, one thing that is very, very bad about this is that super, this approaches one problem, which is very important, the hierarchy problem, but it's completely dismissing a more important problem, which is the cosmological constant problem. Okay, so supersymmetry. You do all this, so well, I, I solve this naturalness issue, um, which is the, 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 the hierarchy problem. And, uh, but on the other hand, uh, I'm neglecting a big problem, which is the cosmological constant problem, that has to be addressed eventually. So then you can say, if someone addresses the cosmological constant problem, uh, you, have co you come up with a mechanism to solve the cosmological constant problem. Maybe that changes the whole thing for the hierarchy problem also. So at the end, someone has to come with a solution to both problems simultaneously. And that hasn't been the case uh, uh, so far, except there is one exception. And uh, so problem. Is the cosmological constant. So, question Can we address both problems at the same time? By both problems, I mean the cosmological constant and the hierarchy problem. Uh, and so far, it's not, it hasn't been the case. For instance, you could have thought that supersymmetry could be used to solve this problem and not the other one. This is a bigger problem. Why don't we use supersymmetry? All these nice cancellations to solve the cosmological constant problem. And that could have been the case. However, that will require, remember that the cosmological constant is 10 to the minus 120 times the uh, n planks uh, to the four. So that will have required that the splitting of the multiples will be extremely small, 10 to the minus something. So th that, that, and we know that uh, we haven't observed particles like that. So, so then supersymmetry by itself cannot solve the, the, the cosmological constant problem because of the the, you will have, then you will have had the splitting of multiples of uh, very, very, very small. Uh, 
but then there is this proposal that uh, to solve the cosmological constant problem, which uh, some people like it, most people hate it. And, uh, and, but it is there, and it's getting some momentum, and that is called the landscape. And this, the landscape comes from, it's an idea that people have uh, worked for several years in, in many guises, but uh, just recently, in the last two years, came up because in a string theory, you come with models uh, for which, in the sense that you have um, a potential with uh, many minima, and many meaning 10 to the 100, so 10 to the 200 or so, or 10 to the 300. So imagine having all these different minima. Each minimum will be a different universe, so we, we will be living in one of them. And uh, so 10 to the hundreds vacuum. And if you have that, then that means that it is natural, quote unquote, to say, well, that to solve the cosmological constant problem, because one of them is, will have the value that we observe. Because there are so many, so essentially, roughly speaking, you have all these many possibilities, so at least you can live, we can live in one of them that has the right value. And the other ones, they don't have the right value, but they are eliminated by uh, Arguments which uh, sometimes are called an anthropic and sometimes are called um, um, environmental, in the sense that you have the cosmological constant a little bit bigger or a little bit smaller, then it, we wouldn't have been able to have galaxies, the whole structure, and not ourselves at all. So, so it's a small change of things uh, 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 from one vacuum to another one. You will not, we would not have been uh, here to observe. So the, the the landscape, in principle approaches this, this question of, of the cosmological constant problem because this vacuum, either we like them or not, they happen to be there in, in, in many models of string theory. So it's something that you don't put in by hand. Sometimes in the past, people have used these anthropic arguments just coming out of the blue. But this time, we cannot just dismiss them because these things are there. So then people say, well, what about if this same idea solves the, cosmo the hierarchy problem? So we don't need all the supersymmetry here to solve the hierarchy problem. Because the same fine tuning that we needed to cancel to, to get a mass of the Higgs very light, we can do it by having all these 10 to hundreds of vacuum, and at the end get one where the Higgs is mass is very small. So all these things, things which are fine tuning, are not that bad because you have a way to fine tune by, by having uh, so many vacuum. Okay. So then people have come out with uh, models which are competition to supersymmetry at low energies, and uh, one of them is. Uh, uh, for instance, uh, it's called split supersymmetry. And a split supersymmetry is an idea that uh, you keep all the good things about supersymmetry and throw away the bad things. <laughs> okay, so that's, that's, that's roughly speaking. And the good things is that you keep the genus uh, or the, to be light, and the bad things are the light, uh, scalars, and you set them very, very heavy. So that is unnatural. But on natural, compensated by 10 to the hundreds, there's one chance that you can you, you get it that way. And uh, and uh, you do that, then you keep the gauge coupling unification, and then you keep uh, uh, dark matter candidates and so on. And you don't have problems with flavor change of neutral coherence and this thing like that. So this is a, this is a candidate for that, and this came out only last uh, year. And there are several uh, other alternatives to this. So I have to tell you this because I don't I have to be. Uh, fair to you in, the, in this lecture that uh, supersymmetry in this way that I presented it is not the only option. Uh, there are other possibilities, and this is a, a very complicated system. Uh, yes. So the only thing is that uh, uh, just we follow Weinberg here very much. Weinberg gave this advice to students uh, last year, a couple of years. Said, don't enter fields which are clean and nice because that means that everything has been done already in that field. And so enter fields which are. Murky and all complicated. So this is one kind of field. Mm -hmm. Okay.